What if there was a number one way to fight climate change? Before we can know that, we have to know what it is that's causing the change. And this matter has been discussed by scientists and politicians at the highest levels since the early 1980s, just as we began to realize the undeniable warming trend worldwide. But along with greenhouse gas emissions, which are the direct result of human activity, our civilizations have always existed during this quaternary glaciation, which is another way of saying that Homo sapien was born sometime after the climax of the most recent ice age to sweep this world. So for those of you who may be hesitant to believe we are in fact living in the midst of an ice age, I suggest you spend a winter in the Arctic Circle, or vacation to the continent we know as Antarctica. As far as we can tell, the Earth's poles have been freezing and melting in a cycle of global warming and cooling for billions of years. In fact, a time such as this, when Earth has both a frozen north and a frozen south pole, well, that appears to be the rarest of glacial periods, which means that the glacial environment of today was never long for this world. These events, one, the product of civilization, and the other, a geological and cyclical process which takes place over the course of millions of years, have aligned. And thus we find ourselves disagreeing and squabbling in an effort to determine just what sort of threat we face and how much of it is currently under our control, if any at all. Now while it's true that virtually the entire scientific community agrees climate change and global warming are in fact taking place. It's also true that with the geological evidence we have today, this has always been the case throughout all of human history. Now Homo sapien also lives presently during the most rapid mass extinction of life in all of Earth's history. So what are we to make of all this? We have to break it down into elements that are within our control right now and separate those factors from the elements that are not within our control. So let's begin with the obvious. Without exploring options unveiled by the prospect of terraforming, we can safely conclude that any climate process which spans an eon, like that of an ice age, the most recent in which we humans have always lived, that process belongs to the Earth alone. But what about the mass extinction part? Now that's happened before too, indiscriminately and sporadically throughout the history of this ruthless world. So how do we contribute to these things? And how can we contribute not to death, destruction, and inhospitality for life, but contribute our efforts instead to life itself? After all, this is the only world in the entire cosmos we can be sure harbors life. So first, we have to understand climate change in a far less anthropocentric manner than we do today in the 21st century. Climate change is not merely the result of human behaviors or human activities. I'm afraid it's not that simple. The sort of climate change we discuss in the media, that's an imbalance between the plant and animal kingdoms of this world. Now in case you're among the many of us who seem to have forgotten, we humans are part of that animal kingdom. Earth's ecosystem functioned in such a way that plants and animals are able to coexist in perfect harmony. Both forms of life are comprised of the same elements. They're just formulated in characteristically different arrangements. Both have an impact on the atmosphere and they have the potential to procreate in a perfectly symbiotic way alongside one another for as long as the Earth remains hospitable to life. Now, carbon dioxide is not the demon molecule that modern civilization would have you believe it is. You see, plants breathe CO2 and they exude oxygen. Animals breathe O2 and so on it goes like yin and yang for all time. Now, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, and other complex greenhouse gases produced by humans have a very real tangible effect on the warming of the planet and they have an exponentially greater potential to do so over that naturally occurring 
carbon dioxide cycle. To what extent are humans altering the gaseous chemical exchange which has been taking place on Earth for nearly a billion years? In this incredibly complex and convoluted equation, we can safely conclude that human beings are responsible for most, if not all, of the world's deforestation and desertification, which translates to the effective extermination of plant life. Plant life which represents the Earth's ability to convert gaseous carbon into oxygen. Humans are responsible for upsetting this balance mostly through means of animal husbandry. On an Earth without humans, there is no livestock. Bovines are able to graze the continents freely, bolstering grasslands wherever they tread. Animal populations are kept in check by the seasons through predation, through sickness, and through fire. Animals don't cut down forests or burn fields to grow annual crops. Animals eat what they need to survive and nothing more. Introduce humans to this world and they effectively replace plants with animals. The humans, they don't grow food sustainably and then the land turns to desert, lifeless and barren. Humans create pollution also primarily from their livestock practices which create oceanic dead zones where not even plankton grow. That's the aquatic equivalent of desertification. Humans are exterminating life by subjugating it. We have systematically and drastically altered the Earth's natural ecosystem in such a way that disrupts the naturally occurring chemical balance which has been taking form in all three states of matter. We've tainted the soil, the land. We've defiled the liquid, the ocean. And we've stirred the gas, the atmosphere. So back to the original question. What is the number one way to undo this damage? We're seeing it take place right now and hardly anybody is talking about it. I'll put it simply. The meat and dairy industries are dying. Economists project how quickly and when they might return. I'll save them the effort. They're not coming back. Government officials seek to save these once bustling sources of economic energy by proposing ways to revitalize the meat and dairy farms. And they're simultaneously trying to stop the climate trend by attacking the transportation and energy industries. They're wasting their time and they're wasting your money. Government can't solve this problem. Only you can. Vegans have already begun the process and we're not going to stop fighting for life on Earth. The explosive popularity of the plant-based diet has given rise to entirely new and unstoppable industries. And the single greatest contribution that any individual can make in the effort to undo the damages caused by human habitation. Are you ready for it? Meat and dairy farmers. Stop everything that you're doing and begin growing plants sustainably. More specifically, start growing industrial hemp. One hectare or 2.5 acres of hemp can remove 24 metric tons or 54,000 pounds of carbon from the atmosphere per year. That's significantly more than any forest on Earth occupying the same amount of space. In America today, soybean farmers are lucky if they're able to earn $40 of profit per acre. Now soy is the primary crop grown for livestock feed and those cultivators are doing significantly better than the dairy or beef farmers themselves in 2019 who are struggling to even break even. Hemp farmers occupying the same space can make 12 times as much, easily. And they don't have to rely on herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, fertilizers, or in many cases, even irrigation to produce those results. This means that hemp fields improve the health of our planet, unlike the overwhelming majority of industrial farming options today. Now, growing hemp for CBD purposes can yield profits of up to $75,000 per acre in today's economy. In addition to being far more profitable for farmers, 
and extracting more carbon from the atmosphere than any other known industrial plant. Hemp is also the most useful crop in the world, by far. So let's recap. If you stop raising cattle for a dairy and meat, by the way, it's a common misconception that dairy cows are not slaughtered. They are, along with almost all of their calves, which are abducted immediately after birth and slaughtered within just a few months. Those calves that are spared are indentured into a life of misery, a fate worse than death. The main difference is that dairy cows are forced into slavery and abuse as humans extract their bodily fluids for years prior to being sold to those nasty slaughterhouses. So if you stop partaking in that heartless, cruel, and environmentally destructive behavior and transform your property into a hemp farm instead, you'll make exponentially more money You'll help to save the environment for future generations. You won't have to work as hard, and you'll provide more utility to human civilization than virtually anybody else by cultivating the most useful crop in the world. It's a no-brainer. And I can't wait to see more stories surfacing around the world of farmers that have already made this transition, and they're currently experiencing greater prosperity than they had ever previously imagined.